Thank you for an opportunity to open your word and to study together. And we ask you, Father, to give us wisdom and insight as we look at your word. And, uh, Father, we just thank you that, uh, that we have this opportunity. Uh, we pray, O oh Lord, that uh, you would guide our thoughts and that the things that we're supposed to learn from this word, uh, our minds will be available to learn. Father, we thank you for what you do for us and the blessings of this week. Father, would you guide us into the remainder of this week and give us opportunity, O oh Lord, I pray, to share your truth and to share with one that may need to know Jesus as a personal Savior. I pray this in Christ's name. Amen. <clears throat> I sing praises and glorify thy name.
prayer needs this evening. Several have come to our attention that we'll add to our list from Sunday. And as we share together, uh, if you have at home special needs and special requests that you need to share, uh, please share those and pray for those as we pray. And if you have some that need to be added, uh, send them to, uh, text them to me or some way, uh, email them to the church, but uh, get uh, those prayer requests in to us. So as we shared needs tonight, again, we want to remember Larry and Bonice, uh, Joy Wilburn, uh, Lucy Tysinger, uh, family of Lanny Brooks and the family of Ira Sloman, uh, Ronald Myers, Rob Ferguson, uh, Mary Lou Barrier, Lucy Wren, Gail Beck, Wanda Lohman, Louise Gilling, uh, again, the family of Kat Vestal, Vicki Alexander, uh, Mike Carr, uh, Frank Barker, the family of Chris Burgess, and also the family of Larry Kearns. Uh, as we pray, uh, again, please take any special needs that you have to the Lord as we pray together. May we pray. Father, we again are very, very thankful that we have an opportunity to come to you on behalf of those that we love and care for and know that uh, there are very special things that uh, are needed in terms of our intercessory prayer uh, for those who are sick, uh, for those having surgery, uh, for those who are recovering from surgery. Uh, to families still dealing with death and uh, the comfort and encouragement that these families need, uh, folks who are undergoing tests. And we just ask you, oh Lord, to look upon each of these needs as only you can and with the riches of glory uh, minister. Uh, we thank you, O oh Lord, that... Uh, we can pray for those who are lost, those who need to know Christ as their personal Savior. And Father, we can pray that uh, we would be a part of reaching out to those uh, who need to know Christ. Uh, Father, the pandemic, the social unrest of our country, uh, God, we need leaders who will listen to you, who will give themselves to you. Uh, we need leaders who will help see that uh, these things can be uh, reconciled through trusting you. Help us, O oh Lord, I pray, that each of us would not take our circumstances for granted, but we would depend wholly on you. Thank you, Lord, for prayers that we've already seen answered. And Father, I pray that you will embrace us with your love and let us share this love in fellowship with each other. I pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Tonight, as we look at the Apostle Paul as we begin the 27th chapter of the book of Acts. Uh, <clears throat> if you were to speak to people today uh, about going on a cruise, you would probably find a lot of folks who have gone on a cruise and they would tell you of the enjoyment of that cruise and the experience of that cruise. I'm pretty sure that what you would say about the Apostle Paul and Luke as they get on the boat that we're getting ready to talk about tonight and begin a voyage to Rome, this would not be your ordinary cruise ship trip. Uh, so
so these ancient ships that uh, the Apostle Paul and uh, Luke were traveling on, uh, most of the time they were very slow. Many times they were very dangerous. Many times they faced extreme disasters. Uh, and to get on one of these ships, uh, most of these voyages probably had some surprises uh, in store for whoever was on uh, these boats. So tonight we begin chapter 27. Uh, the Apostle Paul begins a voyage to Rome. Uh, and uh, we're going to uh, kind of take a look at this tonight and, uh, and begin to see that this is a part of what the Apostle Paul said that he had to do. Uh, he had to go to Rome. He wanted to go to Rome. Verse 1, chapter 27. And when it was decided that we should sail to Italy, they delivered Paul and some other prisoners to one named Julius, a centurion of the Augustan regiment. So entering a ship of Adratim, we put out to sea, meaning to sail along the coast of Asia. Aristarchus, a Macedonian of Thessalonica, was with us. So as they get ready to go on the ship, this is the fourth time that we hear Luke use the word we. Uh, the fourth time in the book of Acts that he uses this word, which means that he was most likely uh, accompanying Paul across the Mediterranean as they headed toward Rome. So what we're going to get in this chapter is an eyewitness account of what Luke uh, can give to us. Uh, Julius, uh, a centurion, uh, this regiment that Julius was commander of was a group uh, that was very, very valuable to Caesar as he uh, took care of many of the military uh, circumstances that Caesar would need a regiment for. Uh, Julius was one of those that was recognized uh, as being one who could be trusted, uh, one who uh, was in himself a powerful man and ready to work. So Paul and his party decide to get on this ship. Uh, they are just... Uh, just west of Asia Minor, uh, they are. Paul is going to get on the ship at Caesarea. It tells us that Aristarchus was on boat with him. If you search scriptures, you will find the Apostle Paul talk about Aristarchus in the fourth chapter of Colossians. And you'll also find him talked about in Philemon. Chances are that Aristarchus was one who was with Paul on a number of his missionary journeys. So why was Aristarchus with the apostle Paul? Uh, it's possible that Julius the centurion was thinking that Aristarchus uh, was one of Paul's servants, uh, that he was there to serve the apostle Paul. 
Now, why would he think that? For a Roman citizen, for an educated Roman citizen, it would not be unusual at all for that particular Roman citizen uh, to have someone who would be a servant or a helper to him to be traveling with him. Uh, and it was not unusual for a prisoner, if he would fall in the circumstances that we just mentioned, being a well-educated Roman citizen, it would not be unheard of for him being a prisoner to have that servant or to have that helpmate with him uh, as they travel together. So uh, with Luke being there, uh, maybe it was common also for your personal physician to travel with you. Be that as it may, we are getting ready to see Paul and other prisoners uh, head out toward Rome. Uh, beginning at uh, verse 3, uh, it seems a little bit unusual that uh, Julius would treat Paul as kindly as he did. Uh, verse 3, the next day we landed at Sidon, and Julius treated Paul kindly and gave him liberty to go to his friends and receive care. Uh, a prisoner, but you release him maybe on his own recognizance to go and have someone minister to him, someone care for him. Uh, but, it was not unusual during those days for this to happen. If you put into a port and you were on a ship and someone you knew was in that port uh, and they could give you provisions for your trip, many times while in port, you were allowed to go to that friend to pick up provisions for yourself because most of these ships were not looking out for every person on board. You had to look out for yourself. So Julius treated Paul kindly. He gave him liberty to go to his friends and receive care. When we had put out to sea from there, we sailed under the shelter of Cyprus because the winds were contrary and when we had sailed over the sea, which is off Cilicia and Pamphylia, we came to Myra, a city of Lycia. What's going to happen here is uh, Paul had certain needs that needed to be met while he was on the ship. Uh, Julius gave him the opportunity to go get uh, maybe food, maybe clothing, other items that Paul might need while on that ship. Uh, when, uh, when we look at this, uh, it says that Julius treated him kindly and gave him liberty to go to his friends and receive care. One of the commentaries that we were reading says, how did Paul have friends here when he had never been here before? Uh, he had not been to Sidon. Uh, so Luke is suggesting to us this term, Friends here comes from uh, the relationship that Jesus' disciples had with him 
when we talk about calling one another friends. Uh, you might go to the third John and read verse 14 and also in John 11, 11 and read those verses to see the correlation of Christians using the terminology friends to reference one another as friends by faith, okay? Uh, Luke has been on enough ships with the Apostle Paul to know that uh, as he talks about the way that they're traveling, uh, they pass to the Lee of Cyprus, which means that they stayed very, very close uh, to the coast of that island, uh, trying to trying to keep those westerly winds from beating the ship to pieces. Now, about two and a half years before this time that we're talking about tonight. Paul's ship was in a very similar situation as it was on its way to Tyre and they had to pass the island of Cyprus. Paul says, or Luke says, uh, when we had sailed over the sea, which is off Cilicia and Pamphylia, we came to Myra, which is a city of Lycia. Uh, it was important. This is a ship that uh, needed all the protection from these winds that it could. The island of Cyprus was a natural shield for this westerly wind. Uh, it should have taken them uh, on an ordinary voyage, uh, it should have taken them about 15 days to make this voyage. Uh, but uh, Myra was a familiar port to grain ships. Uh, and many of these ships uh, started out in Alexandria on the way to Rome. Uh, Myra was a as best we can tell, a wealthy city. It says that Myra had distinguished buildings. So the architecture there was something to behold. There was a tremendous open air theater at Myra. Uh, and as you would look around the city and the port, there was evidence that Myra was a, a wealthy town. We see that something needed to change, uh, and chances are it was a larger ship. Verse 6 says, the centurion found an Alexandrian ship sailing to Italy, and he put us on board. When we had sailed slowly many days and arrived with difficulty off Sidus, the wind was not permitting us to proceed. We sailed under the shelter of Crete off Salomon, Passing it with difficulty, we came to a place called Fair Havens near the city of Lycia. An Alexandrian grain ship, a privately owned ship, a grain ship that was leased by the Roman government. It happened to be available uh, this grain ship and being leased to the Roman Empire was carrying cargo that was absolutely essential to the stability of the Roman Empire. Uh, these ships were large. These ships were uh, 
were usually the best that you could get to ride the Mediterranean Sea. But it tells us that even this green ship had trouble in the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, they had difficulty, uh, and they were about 130 miles from Myra. The, the winds were so strong that the pilot uh, could not make port, so they had to sail right along the Isle of Crete. Uh, and without question, this grain ship was fighting for its life. Uh, this ship uh, was fortunate to make it to Fair Havens. Uh, and what they were trying to do as they sailed along this coast was shelter the ship, keep the ship together as best you can. Uh, as, they, as they get near Snidus, uh, this again about 130 miles from Myra, uh, the ship being forced southward. Uh, and Luke is giving you a description of this. So if you want to go to a map and read these verses and pinpoint where this ship was at and what it was doing, uh, you could do so. The biggest problem that we have here is that the sailing season is just about over. And they're trying to make it to Rome. And this is the hardest part of the sailing season to get there. It would be very, very dangerous. Uh, so Paul, if you look in verse 9, uh, Luke has been giving us a lot of geographical details. Now look at what Paul does. Now when much time had been spent and sailing was now dangerous because the fast was already over, Paul advised them saying, Men, I perceive that this voyage will end with disaster and much loss not only of the cargo and ship, but also our lives. Nevertheless, the centurion was more persuaded by the helmsman and the owner of the ship than by the things spoken by Paul. Because the harbor was not suitable to winter in, the majority advised to set sail from there also if by any means they could reach Phoenix, a harbor of Crete, opening toward the southwest and northwest and winter there. Uh, winter, you know, we're on the low side of the fall of the year. Winter is rapidly approaching. When Luke talks about because the fast was already over, he's talking about the Day of Atonement. If you've ever heard the word Yom Kippur mentioned, uh, this is what he's talking about. The day of the fast is over. We're into the fall of the year. Uh, and this ship has already lost precious time because it was struggling. It was having a hard time uh, getting away from those westerly winds. The Apostle Paul sees this as impossible to get to Italy. Uh, the navigation in this part of the Mediterranean uh, from the middle of September uh, till the beginning of November uh, was very difficult. From the middle of November, they said that the Mediterranean is impossible to navigate, impossible to go through. Again, Paul says to those that would hear him, 
When much time had been spent, sailing was now dangerous, the fast was over, Paul advised them. Uh, suppose you're the ship captain. Suppose you are the owner of the ship who happened to be on the ship. Suppose you are one of those in charge of this ship. Suppose you're the one driving this ship, the helmsman. Suppose you are that man and a Roman prisoner walks up to you and says to you, I think it's too rough for us to go any farther. What are you likely to say to that Roman prisoner who has never piloted a ship before. However, he has already been in two shipwrecks, so being in two shipwrecks might give him an upper edge on these guys. But he says, this voyage is going to end with disaster. It's going to end with loss. You're going to lose the cargo. You're going to lose the ship. You're going to lose lives. If you insist on doing this, if you go further, this is what's going to happen. <clears throat> Without question, the Apostle Paul knew what happened in the Mediterranean. He was basing his ideas on what generally happened in the Mediterranean. He understood these were going to be dangerous waters. So who is he likely talking to? The helmsman, the pilot, the owner of the boat, anybody else. Uh, the centurion. <coughs> Paul's wisdom uh, is going to show has already shown. So they listened and they made their own choice. Uh, whether Paul called a formal meeting or whether he just happened to meet them on deck to share this information with them, uh, we probably won't never know. But uh, we're going on. Who makes the choice? The pilot. He's the administrator. He's the one over the boat. So he makes the choice. Who helps him make the choice? The owner of the boat. Why did the owner of the boat want to go? He had a cargo there that he needed to get rid of. He needed this. His reasoning for this might have been very, very selfish. Let me get to a major point where I can sell my wares. Uh, just let me get there. Uh, westerly winds uh, have posed a problem for this, and it's going to change even more uh, as we push along here. Uh, what the Apostle Paul said uh, did not persuade the centurion. The centurion was more persuaded by the helmsman and the owner than by the things that Paul said. So we're going to push on. Uh, because the harbor was not suitable for wintering, uh, to winter in, the majority advised to set sail from there. Why did the centurion want to go to a better place? Uh, he had a regiment of men, and he was looking for the easiest place that he could house these men for the winter. Verse 13 says, The south wind blew softly, supposing that they had obtained their... And they supposed that they had obtained their desire putting out to sea. They sailed close by Crete, but not long after a tempestuous wind arose called Eurocliden. When the ship was caught and could not head into the wind, we let her drive. And running under the shelter of an island called Clauda, we secured the skiff 
with difficulty. When we had taken it on board, they used cables to undergird the ship, fearing lest they should run aground on Sirtis sands. And they struck sail and were so driven. And because we were exceedingly tempest-tossed the next day, they lightened the ship. On the third day, we threw the ship's tackle overboard with our own hands. Now when neither sun nor stars appeared for many days and no small tempest beat on us, all hope that we would be saved was finally given up. But after long abstinence from food, then Paul stood in the midst of them and said, Men, you should have listened to me and not have sailed from Crete and incurred this disaster and loss. And now I urge you to take heart, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. For there stood by me this night an angel of God to whom I belong and whom I serve, saying, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must be brought before Caesar, and indeed God has granted you all those who sail with you. Therefore take heart, men, for I believe God that it will be just as it was told me. However, we must run aground on a certain island. Why didn't we listen to this guy? What did he have in mind? Uh, why didn't we stop when we should have stopped? Uh, and now Paul is going to share another incident with them. Uh, about everything has happened that you could possibly imagine could happen as they try to lighten the load, drop the anchor, pull down the sails, uh, throw overboard everything that could go overboard. Uh, and disaster was just, just before happening. And here comes this prisoner back to say, God revealed to me. Now, on this ship that was on its way to Rome, chances are on this ship headed to Rome, there were many men who had already called out to maybe a multitude of gods. You know, when people get in a bind, they scream for every person that they think can help them. They cry out to any god that they think might be listening, but there was only one god listening. And there was only one God that could do what God was getting ready to do for Paul and these men. So Paul says to them, uh, God has given to me absolute assurance that no one will lose their life on this ship. Uh, There's a little bit of a problem. Uh, Paul warned that if the sailors were successful in escaping the ship, uh, the Roman soldiers would lose their lives. If the people on the ship allowed the prisoners to escape, the Roman soldiers would be put to death. Uh, so the soldiers, we put a stop to this, we're going to find later on in the chapter. But listen carefully. Take heart, men. I believe God. It will be just as it was told me. However, we must run aground on a certain island, which means that they were going to have to do some serious navigating. However, at this point, God was going to do the navigation, and this ship was going to set itself on the island that God had designed for it to happen. 
All of a sudden, the Apostle Paul has brought to them news that they did not believe could happen to them. The next time we're together as we come here, uh, we will deal with the shipwreck that's just ahead. Let's pray. Okay, we just got word that Dean Osborne passed away. Uh, we just received that word since we started. So please remember uh, Glenda and the family in your prayers. May we pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the word that has been given to us. And Father, we thank you for the faith of the Apostle Paul, who even in the face of shipwreck and the possibility of losing life is still depending on you, Lord, to deliver him to go to Rome that he might witness and share his faith. Father, as we share together tonight, we pray for the family of Dean Osborne. We pray for... Uh, Glenda and all of the family, we pray, O oh Lord, that the comfort of your spirit will be with them and grant them power, comfort, encouragement. Father, hear us as we pray and be gracious and merciful in Christ's name. Amen.